we have made a lot of videos of various aspects of middle game end game and most of it of course mo most of all about the openings but I had enormous amount of requests of uh, <coughs> making for making uh, DVDs to teach people how they can learn how to study and how to how to improve gradually well obviously just playing openings correctly is not enough and just learning certain combinations tactics and end games that's not enough either because there are other aspects of the game such as uh, developing plan finding the right criteria for searching moves for searching plans and for that we have special school school that teaches you how to do all that and there is only one right way to do it and that's what that's the way I learned because I was fortunate enough to uh, grow up uh, uh, in Russia the best country for uh, playing chess for learning chess I don't know what el what else is it best for but that's about it maybe so there is only one correct way to play to learn chess and I learned it uh, I I realized that when I saw after I came to uh, United States and I saw some people a lot of people, a lot of good players, even good players, they were self-taught. And when you are self-taught, obviously, it's not as, uh, you cannot achieve as great of a results. And finally, what happens with a good chess player, he becomes better and better and better. The, he becomes better because he realizes what is missing in his game and what is missing in his game those are the components that's supposed to be installed in his chess skill bank in a very very beginning and then you progress if if it's done that way you progress a lot quicker and uh, become eventually you become a lot better player so we know that what Russian school tells you. Uh, you have to develop pieces quickly and castle. But that tell, every chess school tells you this. Even uh, if you had to guess by yourself, you can uh, come to this conclusion. But there are a lot more other things. While you develop peace, you have to develop pieces in a proper position. Coordinate those pieces properly. They, these pieces have to be very active, but that's not enough to be very active because single piece alone, if it's active, it doesn't do much well. It has also to very well coordinate with your other pieces. Russian School of Chess contains several different basic ideas of a strategy, coordinated attack, and tactics. Um, every strong player today, beginning strong master and up to the uh, very elite of chess players, they do play using basics of components, probably all components of Russian chess school. Some of them learned it as a Russian chess school and some of them didn't, but they still play that way. The why this happens is because they follow basics of Russian chess school will make you a very strong player. 
But if you never followed and never studied those basics, you just see the games of best chess players. And as you see, as you play more and more and more games and you become better chess players, whether you like it or not, you are using those principles without even knowing. And they make a lot of sense. And finally, you become very strong players and in your arsenal is all the weapons you have all the weapons of the russian chess school let me give you fisher example fisher for example there weren't that many super strong players but he was studying games of russian players when he was very young 10 11 years old he was studying uh what they had to say about it he even learned uh some chess uh, <coughs> so little uh russian that is enough to uh, read the chess books so and that's that helped him a great great deal i know this for fact Fisher himself, even though later on he demolished all Russian players, but the school, he did not demolish Russian chess school. He used it as a weapon. Now, let me show you <clears throat> some of the important components. Now, we just saw in the French. So the question we can have here how can very experienced player make so many wrong decisions? Well, because what Russian school teaches you, yeah, you have to use your own logic, but you can structure logic several different ways. You have to make sure that your logic follows the, the ground rules you follow ground rules uh, using your logic you don't make six seven moves in early stage of the game with the same piece well there are different aspects of the strategy uh, activity of the pieces we already mentioned and now I'm going to show you one very instructive game played by two representatives of great Russian school between Mikhail Botvinnik and Yefim Geller. Well, even they sometimes fail to um, activate all their pieces. Well, let's go with the game. <laughs> It's a common problem. You plunge into a mass of variations, lose your way, see your time disappearing, then plump for the first move that comes into your head. There's got to be a better way. What you need is 2020 calculation. Calculation is one of the most important skills that a chess player should develop, and at the same time, it's one of the least discussed. So what is calculation? Calculation is being able to foresee a series of moves with accuracy and then to assess the resulting position. It sounds tricky, but we can all do it. Just take a look at this position. It's Black's move here. Material is level, but there's this isolated pawn in the centre of the board which is attacked twice by Black's pieces. The bishop on f6 and the rook on d7 both attacking that pawn, and it's defended only once by the rook on d1. OK, well, black thinks he can take that, so now he has a choice. He can either take it with the rook or the bishop. First of all, you look at the at rook takes pawn. Rook takes pawn. Rook takes rook. Bishop takes rook. 
But then at the end of that, white plays bishop takes pawn, and the position is looking dead level, opposite color bishops, equal material. Must be a draw. Let's look at the other possibility. Bishop takes pawn on d4. Well, that looks much better. It seems as though black is simply winning a pawn here. Um, the only trick that white might have here is to play bishop takes pawn on b7. Well, of course, if rook takes bishop, then rook takes bishop and white is fine. But black has the little trick here. Bishop takes f2 check. King takes bishop. And then rook takes rook on d1. And black has a winning endgame. Having looked at those simple lines, we can deduce that bishop takes pawn on d4 is the correct move for black. Let's just recap on my thought processes there. I looked at two starting moves and then went through the variations systematically, deducing at the end that bishop takes pawn was the correct move. This simple position illustrates the two main skills that are involved with calculation. First, you must be able to analyse a position accurately. That is, you have to be able to see ahead several moves. And the second skill is assessment. You must be able to assess a position accurately at the end of one of those very... Does your mind go woolly when there's no clear method of attack? Do your games too often just consist of a beginning, a muddle and an end? A better understanding of positional chess will immeasurably improve your game and it's simply more satisfying to have a grand scheme in the back of your mind. So what is positional chess? A positional move is one which is not a tactic, does not involve a combination, but either strengthens your position or weakens your opponents. Dr. Max Over once said that strategy demands reflection, tactics demand a penetrating glance, and it's the reflection on a position that I want to look at here. The ways in which you may strengthen your position can take many forms. Three key ideas are improving the position of your king, improving your pawn structure, and manoeuvring a piece to a more effective square. How you manoeuvre your pieces is one of the most important aspects of positional chess. It's amazing how if you get one redundant piece and put it on the right square, then somehow your whole position works and your opponent's position can sometimes just collapse. This is one classic example of this. This is a game I had a few years ago against Matthew Sadler. I was playing black. Here it's black to move. I think black's doing rather well here. Look at those rooks doubled on the e-file, putting pressure on the knight on e2. Now, of course, the knight is defended by the bishop, so they can't launch in straight away. But what's really another thing that's really nice about black's position is the bishop on g7 and the knight on f5 looking at that pawn on d4. Now, if you notice, that pawn cannot be protected by another pawn. It relies on the support of the knight on e2, which, remember, is being looked at by the rooks, the support of the rook on d1, and the queen on a4. So there's uncomfortable pressure on white's position. Moreover, the pin of the bishop to the queen is a little bit annoying. It means it's very difficult for white to untangle. There's lots of pressure on white's position, but it's not immediately obvious how black should make progress here. I think the obvious move is to play rook takes knight on e2. Sacrifice an exchange. And after bishop takes e2, well, knight takes d4. After all, that bishop on a5 is looking a bit loose. How many times do you begin an attack against your opponent's king only to find that you've overlooked a devastating counterpunch. Don't worry, help is at hand. This video is all about how you can attack with confidence. What I'm not going to show you here is a whole series of positions with multiple peace sacrifices finishing off a game with a grand flourish. 
Instead, I'm going to look at how to build up an attacking position, a skill which is just as important to master as the finishing tactics, and an area which is often neglected. It's all very well being a razor-sharp tactician, but if you can't get to a position where you can use your skill, what good does that do you? You must begin your attack from a sound basis. The first question to ask is, do I have enough pieces that can join in the battle? Let me show you a game of mine where I got completely carried away with some mad attacking scheme and found that really I didn't have the resources to back it up. I was playing white against Heike Westerinen from Finland. I played pawn to e4 and he answered pawn to e5. I played knight f3, he defended the pawn with knight c6 and I played the Spanish. He played his pawn to g6 which is a reasonable system for black to play. I played my pawn to c3 preparing d4 and he strengthened his center with d6. I played the standard move d4 so I've got a nice center. Bishop d7 breaking the pin and now I decided to push on with d5. That's still okay. Knight came back to e7. I captured on d7 and he recaptured with the queen. And I played c4. The position has changed a little bit from a standard Spanish type position. It almost it looks a bit more like a King's Indian now because of the blocked centre. With the pawn move c4, I'm actually tempting black to snaffle a pawn right in the opening. And Westerinen is not going to back down from a challenge. And he went for it. He played the outrageous move, queen to g4 neglecting his development. Well, I really don't believe that move because I think it's just too early to be moving the queen out. So I defended my g-pawn and got castled at the same time and gave up my e-pawn. But I figured that I was going to gain so much time by attacking his queen that it was worth pawn to get on the attack. I gave a check with my queen Queen a4 check, and he blocked with c6. So this is important. What I'm doing now is opening up the position, and that means I'll be able to exploit my lead in development. But it's here that I got completely carried away with a totally batty attacking plan. Now here, I should probably just develop my knight, attack his queen, and then try and open up the position and get a quick attack. Pretty simple. Knight c3 is a standard developing move. And, well, I don't know, on any other day, <laughs> I think I'd have just played that straight away. But I remember on that day, I was in a terrible mood. I was feeling impatient. I was desperate to go for the win. In other words, I was not thinking rationally. I'd lost the run of myself. I wanted a quick kill, and I played queen to b4. Well, that just goes against all the general principles. I should just bring out a knight. I shouldn't move my queen again. It's already in a good attacking position. My specific idea of playing queen b4 is obviously I'm attacking two pawns. And I thought the only way to defend against this sensibly is to castle queenside, which Westerinen played. And now I thought, great, I've dragged his king over across to the queen side where it's a little bit exposed, it's away from the rest of his pieces and I can get a, a really strong attack. <laughs>
that is a total bore and most of the material will be completely irrelevant. What I'm going to be doing here is selecting the endgames that you really need to know. The great thing about endgame theory is that it doesn't change. It's not like openings where you study a system and then find that six months later some kid in the Russian Junior Championship has refuted it. The basic endgames do not change. What Lucena worked out in 1497 still holds true 500 years later. I've always enjoyed playing endings because when there are just a few pieces on the board, there's an elegant simplicity about ideas that isn't always displayed in other areas of the game. Before I get stuck into the essential goodies, just take a look at this endgame study of Retty, composed in 1921. I find this an extraordinary position. White has just one pawn here on c6, which is moving down towards the 8th rank. Of course, black going in the opposite direction. Now, white can actually draw this position. It's, it's really hard to imagine when you look at it, because it seems as though the black king is just about to wander over and snaffle the, the white pawn. Um, and then black has three pawns, which are just going to win very easily. It seems as though white can't actually move in to take the g-pawn because the black pawns will then move down to get a queen. But amazingly, white can draw this position. Just watch. It's, it's, I find it very hard to, to believe, even when I know the study. White plays king to g6. OK, first things first. Let's just see what happens if the black king comes across to take the pawn. So king to b6. Well, white plays king takes pawn on g7. And now, if king takes pawn on c6, then king takes f6 will draw for white because the king will just march over to take the h-pawn. So instead, black pushes one of the pawns, let's say pawn to h5. But then white plays king takes f6. Well, there's a threat of king g5 to take the h-pawn, so the h-pawn must march on. And it still looks as though black is completely winning. White can't stop the h-pawn moving down to the 8th rank to get a queen. And the black king still has that c-pawn firmly under control. However, white can draw this position. It's extraordinary. The move is king to e5. Now, it's a brilliant move because there's the threat to come back and stop the h-pawn. And at the same time, the white king threatens to support the c-pawn. So, in order to play for the win, black must push the h-pawn, pawn to h3. And now white plays king to d6, supports the c-pawn, on after h2, pawn to c7, black gets a queen, h1, and white gets queen as well, and the position is drawn. It's just queen against queen. Let's see what happens if black tries something a bit different. Pawn to h5. That's a very tricky move. Because if white plays the obvious king takes h5, stopping that pawn, then king b6 wins. Because king g6, king takes pawn on c6, and now... It's, it's an easy win for black, because if king takes g7, then the pawn marches down the board to get a new queen. Here's where you're going to learn how to play the opening properly. Now, if you master the ideas I'll discuss on this video, you needn't fear anything the opponent can throw at you. And we'll draw up a list of general principles, ideas, which will make your opening play rock solid. Now there are many, many different chess openings and it's not for me to tell you which to play or which you shouldn't play. There's enough variety for everyone. But I think we can find some common ground, some ideas which go throughout the entire range of chess openings. And let's get down to the most important idea first, I think. Because of White's first move, his extra move, he's got a slight advantage to begin with. So if you're white, rather like the server in tennis, I'd be expecting you to press, to attack, 
to utilise, to use your extra move. And similarly, if you're black, I'd be expecting you to try and neutralise the advantage of white's first move. And there are many, many different ways you can do that, of course. And there are other general principles which we can follow on from this. Firstly, you need to learn how to develop your pieces quickly and effectively to use them as a unit to work all together. You have to play to control or occupy the centre in the opening. This is very important. The centre of the board is the most important area at the start. If you get a grip on the centre, it's likely you're going to have the advantage. And remember, to, this idea of getting your pieces working together is the crucial one. The beginner lashes out, maybe moving the queen around or just using one or two pieces, this and that. You need to learn how to use your pieces as a unit. And it's this idea we'll take with us as we go now to look at the games. <laughs> In this first game, we're going to learn how quick development can be used to advantage. We're going to see why castling early is very important. And we're also going to learn that pawn grabbing, even at grandmaster level, is usually fatal in the opening stage of the game. Get your pieces out. Don't munch material. Well, first up for you, we've got a real cracker of a game between two top grandmasters. Walter Brown from the United States and Miguel Quinteros from Argentina. And it's really remarkable how a game between two grandmasters can highlight some very basic points about how to play the opening correctly. But here we'll see black breaking all the rules and get punished for it. Now the opening, as you might expect between two top players, was fairly straightforward. White played 1e4, that's the most aggressive move to start off with because it lets out all the pieces. And black employs an opening known as the Sicilian defence. This opening has found favour with many of the world's top players and virtually all the world champions because it kind of dissuades white from playing d4 early on, which dominates the centre. It's a very good opening and I highly recommend it. White plays knight f3. This is a regular Sicilian move. And black plays d6, just bolstering up his centre pawn. And now comes bishop to b5 check. This is a very sensible move, rather dull actually, and normally aggressive players prefer the move d4 here, pawn to d4. But bishop b5 check in itself is a very good move. It develops a piece, gives check and threatens black. So not so bad after all. Quinteros played bishop d7, and white just exchanged the bishops. Bishop takes d7, Queen takes d7. And now comes the first slightly unusual move by white. Pawn to c4. Now I've actually highlighted what I think white's after in this position. He's trying to get a grip on the square d5. That's a very important central square, which, if white's allowed to dominate it, will stop black from doing things throughout the entire game. So that's white's aim. The pawns on c4 and e4 control the square d5, and the knight on b1 will come out to c3, again emphasising white's control of d5. And hereabouts, black has really got to form a plan. How's he going to combat this hold on d5? Well, black can develop his pieces in many ways here, but what Quinteros does is incredibly risky and cannot really be recommended as good. This is the second of three shows in the Learn Chess series, and this show will deal with the middle game. Now let's say somebody asks you to assess a middle game position, threw it down in front of you, and just asks you to, to judge it. What sorts of things should you be looking at? Well, I'm going to give you a list now which I think will help you. The first thing I would look at is the respective position of the kings. Who has the safer king position? I think this is very important when we're trying to judge a position. Then I'd go on to make a basic count of the pieces. I mean, obviously, if you're heading material, it's very important to try and consolidate that leading material and go on to win the game from there. If you're behind in material, you're looking for compensation. Maybe the attack, maybe the initiative, maybe more active pieces. At any rate, some compensation for the lost material is very important. After that I recommend you look at the pawn structure. Who has the better pawn structure in the position? Isolated pawns, double pawns, pawn islands. Try to assess whose pawn structure is superior. 
After that, I look at the pieces. Whose pieces are more active? Generally, in Master Chess, or at any level really, the player with the more active pieces has the better game. And finally, and this is a real master tip, try to assess the position if the queens have been exchanged. I mean, maybe the queens are exchanged already. It's quite rare at the start of the middle game for that to happen. So try to imagine who will be better after an exchange of queens. The end game is the most difficult part of the game to play. Precision is required. And I think what we would most benefit from is method to help us here. That's what I'm going to try and teach you. Now, I'm going to show you some simple techniques which I hope will help you to play the end game better. Now, the first thing to realise is that the master cannot keep all the important end games in his mind. Instead, he uses guidelines to help him work his way through the various positions he'll encounter at the board. And here for you now are those important master tips which will undoubtedly help you to improve your game. <laughs> In this little section, you're going to learn how important the king is in the endgame. The king is a strong piece. Use your king aggressively and actively. 